Fuck GTO, GTO has got to go say no to GTO, kids. Unless you learn it from Yuri Pelag. Yuri Pelag is one of the best poker theoreticians in the world. One of the only people who I really trust to understand the theory of the game in the way that it's meant to be understood. Really understands the nuances of exploitative poker. How to get inside the mind of other people. How to outthink and outsmart and outstrategize the other opponent. This is a, an excerpt from a two-hour clip where he and I go over... Firstly, his footage, and I criticize and give my opinion, then my footage where he criticizes and gives his opinion. Two different worlds combining into one. If you want to see the rest of it, go over to my new website, eliteuniversity.co.uk, and if you're watching this like a week in the future, we're changing it to eliteuniversity.com. Beautiful things coming, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. It's really, really cool. We get in some pretty sick debates. Peace. All right. Uh this is very similar to the other spot where I'm just like, oh, <laughs> they've gone big on this board in a spot where I know a bunch of these, these 5, 10, 2, 5 regs, even, even up to the high stakes, they like choosing smaller sizes sometimes to target high size and king highs. So already I'm like, oh, get out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm obviously never in a million years folding, but um, let's, let's see what he was. When you say that, um, that there haven't been recent um, metagame shifts, oh, sorry, there haven't been big bets recently. Do you mean that in general, people have been using like a quarter and a third in these kind of spots? Uh, when, I, when I was playing higher volume, I'd see a lot more, one third to 50 and 75 was actually very rare. Yeah, I've seen, I see, I see a lot of a third. Like, I see a lot of people literally just using a third in every spot, basically. <laughs> and then, the, yeah, except on like the ace queen fives where they'll, they'll, they've suddenly added some, some really big beds. All right. So, thinking about what I would do on this river, the only two options are check raise and bet big. Given the fact that he went big on the flop and that we have a 10. Mm -hmm. um yeah check race seems almost mandatory i think yeah then that's what i was thinking hmm. i was basically calling that my hand feels like it's, it's a no. so, i might have gone a bit big here but yeah let, let's hear what you think so his value range is going to be a lot of kings and queens king jack queen jack the first thing i would think here is that when we check raise a lot of players will talk themselves into saying that they have good blockers to call um so what i would try and do is i would try and rep king queen here um and assume that when they turn up with kings and queens they're going to think that because I've got a huge size that looks like, you know, I'm repping King Queen, they're going to, they're going to have to call this exact combo. Um, and sometimes if they turn up with King Jack, they might have the same thought. And sometimes if they turn up with Queen Jack, they might have the same thought. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'll just go big. I'll just go like 55, something like that. What, what, how would you approach this? Um, so, so I, um, this isn't a spot I, I feel like I'm good at, um, I'm not good at knowing how big of a size and people will call. Um, I, I like the, the thought process with the Kings and Queens. I, I generally kind of go with, uh, like what is the, the theoretical sizing and then throw in some some exploitative stuff to, to alter the sizing. So I think uh, the first question is, uh, do we have the effective nuts or not? Not quite. Like but, how, but... how often is he showing up with, with a better hand? Is it 1% yeah. or less? Or, or is Yeah, it... maybe, maybe like fucking with the sizing on the river as well. Yeah, maybe like 2%. 
Uh, so, so it, so in that case, it, we we do have the the effectiveness, the the size should be to just chop. Uh, I have a feeling that's a bad value size, though. Yeah, I got a feeling it's a bad value size as well. Yeah, where he's just gonna fold everything, but then, at the very least, we should be block chopping here a lot. Um. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I would. It's a scary thing, especially when, especially when you're me. If somebody knows that I'm that, that I'm me, I just get called so much. So you you should shut them. Yeah, you know this is just probably an unexplored part of my database of how mm -hmm. much people will call shoves in. Because when I've got value, I have like such a strong feeling that they're gonna. If you call don't, if I go like fifty five. And mm -hmm. if I've got a bluff, I'm like, oh fucking, everyone just calls me, so I just don't bluff. <laughs> but that yeah, obviously that's leaves. Up. So, so this... that's uh, the interesting thing about these spots is uh, the theoretical sizing with the nuts is to shove in, and it's not close. It, it just makes you more money to, mm -hmm. to go bigger bets with polarized ranges. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And uh, a lot of people have your exact thought process of when they have value, they're like, he's never going to call me. And when they have a bluff, it's, it's super scary to, to throw in a hundred big lines. At a, at a it's, it's not that I don't think they're going to call me. It's that I, I feel very confident that going something like 50 something here, a hand like King Jack will still consider it. And Kings and Queens will pretty much just always throw it in. Yeah. But there's, there's something that happens when you shove or when you go like ludicrously big, where yeah. some percentage of the population just starts overfolding huge mm -hmm. um, and they really start like really thinking about it. And I feel like this is, this is one of those spots. Um, but I, I also, yeah, I think I should just be bluff shoving the spot to be honest. <laughs> I think I, mean, I think you, you should try it at, at least, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree in practice 50, 50 sounds like a good size. Yeah. Let's see what your your does. So would would the solver really take all of the nuts here, like all of the the jack tens or better, uh, or I guess even you can go even even worse than that, uh, and maybe you can't actually, maybe like jet deuce if you have that. I I think the solver is the other player would slow play. A decent yeah, okay, on the okay. turn, and, and that doesn't happen in practice. So we're we're kind of all off the rails here. That makes sense. And yeah, you're, you're gonna see an, an interesting result at the end. That's what I said. Whoa. <laughs> I like the check back with nines. What, why do you like it? I don't know, but intuitively I like it against you. Um, maybe because of that exact reason, maybe because of how it played out and how often that can play out. Um, but, and there are some, some runouts where you get to then raise river when on like a pad board. There are a million uh, runouts where you get to raise river, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I mean on 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 pad boards uh, specifically, you get to have an uncapped range. Um, I would never do it. <laughs> I'd never, I'd never check back there, but I, I kind of like it. Um, it's so so it's a theoretical play to to check back there sometimes, and the the reason is that uh, <clears throat> when I turn like forty combos of straights, yeah. And nines is not really interested in going for stacks anymore. Yeah, yeah. And when a hand doesn't go for stacks, which is, it's not intuitive to, for that to be the case with a set, uh, then it starts mixing in checkbacks. Like there is not such a huge incentive to always bet. Um, and then you get these benefits of having a range on the river that's a lot tougher to read. And then I can't check check raise with abandon and like you're gonna have more maybe you even check back seven eight sometimes it, re it reminds me of a hand i played it was probably like eight years ago now and i i checked back pocket eights on nine eight six 
four mm -hmm. when the flush had come in on the turn. Mm -hmm. And I had the eight, eight with the flush blocker as well. Um, and then it, I paired on, I paired the four on the river, the guy bet and I got to raise ginormous and mm -hmm. I, and I, and I got, I got hero called. And I think that that was why I was liking the, the check back on the turn because I, I remember in that spot, like, oh, I'm not going for three streets. So, you know, whatever, if I'm going to check back, I said, this is going to be a plus if it pairs. And then the exact thing happens where it pairs and he just pays me off for, I, I raised so big, it was un unreasonable. <laughs> and I think that people, even though it, it's one of those spots where it looks like you would never be bluffing when mm -hmm. it's me, people always end up just paying me off anyway. Um, and probably when it's you playing, you know, playing this low as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, it's, how, it's funny how one hand can kind of like uh, structure the way that you think about something. Even it might not be the the best way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and does this play something you have worked out in your head systematically, or you just go for it in a moment? Um, the thought process is systematic. It, it wasn't to begin with, but as I became a, a coach, I decided to try and explain what was going on in my head and um, making a very loose call here because it's the jack eight guy, by the way. Um, uh, four bet would make sense, except he called a four bet jack eight. So <laughs> probably just have to try to take it to the streets. Um, yeah, I, I really, I've learned how to layer up a thought process of somebody else. And the, the, the number one thing I ran into as a coach was that and I'm sure you, you've met this, is that most people have very messy thought processes. Very, very messy. Like they think about one thing way too much. They don't think about another thing. It's kind of like they don't really have a structure to the way they think about it. Maybe maybe less so when it gets to the high stakes, but definitely for like the, the lower stakes and mid stakes people. And what I, what I try to do is I try to teach people how to play the hand first and then uh, build up, build up after that. So if you, I always go, what is my opponent's range and what am I going to do about it? So when I'm coaching somebody here, I'll be like, okay, when he's three bet, what are his, what are his hands? And they'll be like, aces, kings, uh, queen X, jacks, tens, nines, then uh, yeah, oh, okay. some high guards and then some like whatever other bluffs he can have. Um, and then I'll be like, okay, what does our hand specifically want to do against that range? And what, how are we going to do that? Um, so that's kind of like the the simplified way, but in the moment, it's a lot of just like uh, intuition. So, so in this kind of spot with this player, you would be thinking, uh, let, let, let me guess, but the thought process would be uh, that his range is so all over the place that uh, you should basically be turning a deuce into a bluff. That's what I'm thinking now. I don't know what past Charlie's going to be thinking. So, so if he goes half off. You yeah, yeah. I hope I hope if he goes half, then I don't fold. But it's you know you know you never know. It. But uh, yeah, maybe against like pot, I'd fold everything, and then half, I'd probably bluff raise a lot. And, and you have a very high red line, right? When you play, yeah, ball. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's too high. Yeah. And 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 here your thought is, you know, this is the the aggro guy with the wide range. It he, he's not gonna have a range that that can defend here. Yeah, exactly. And I, I go small here because I think I think it's going to be quite inelastic with the way he plays. I think min rays specifically would get a lot less folds, a lot fewer folds. But I think um, well, this should, versus like you should throw out the the emoji. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. So now it's almost a guarantee that he's folding after after the tank and the emoji. <laughs> So I, th I think this is a very, very instructional hand for uh, why you have a positive red line and why a knowing theory can can limit your options. Because uh, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, this hand should always fold preflop mm -hmm. to his size. Um, and uh, even if you say, okay, this guy is going to be wide, so I'm going to call more. Uh, this hand should still probably fold, like this hand would fold if it were a heads up three bet. Mm -hmm. And and generally, him three betting stuff like jack eight off here is is not so much a mistake 
against the button it's more a mistake against the big blind if that makes sense mm -hmm. because uh, big blind can three bet jack eight off against a button open mm -hmm. uh, but small blind has the big blind left to act who can cold four bet him so he has to be more selective with his hands does that make sense yeah yeah uh, so uh, generally to me if i have this wild drag in the small blind who's over three betting i would just fold this pre-flow uh, that makes sense yeah I, I i think that intuitively i just felt like i would be able to make it plus ev yeah, yeah. And, and then what happens say so you see the flop and, and i see queen six three and i know that uh when he bets uh do, do you know theoretically how you choose bluff raises from your range against half pot in the spot or just in general against any size what's the the process for for picking hands to bluff them uh i don't know the answer that you're about to give me <laughs> i think <laughs> uh, so so because you don't know you're like you know this is a cool spot to bluff raise it's gonna overfall right but because yeah. i because i know the the process I mean, I, if if I, I were I if I were like, playing against a, a professional here, I would just choose hands that are probably not strong enough to call, but have some backdoor potentials. So, so generally, what you're supposed to do is all of your continues uh, come from hands that are good enough to call. Okay, so any hand that is not good enough to call is not good enough to raise. Um, and and you get to do that, and there are plenty of hands that are good enough to call, and you can raise with, right? Like you can raise with King Jack of Spades, and you can call with King Jack of Spades. It's an okay hand for for both lines. And in in theory, you don't get to have like this wild, crazy ranging raising range. So there there are more than enough combos to choose from. You can way over bluff, and still kind of stay within bounds of you're never showing down anything you shouldn't be showing down in a way uh, that makes sense i think uh, I, I think in recreational player lands you want to choose hands that aren't good enough to call because i think that then like in this spot i think he's, people are just going to be overfolding like ace king ace jack of hearts and stuff like that I, I i would say here you you just need to throw theory completely out of the window because like you said his his range is constructed in a way uh where raising just prints money right mm -hmm. there's no he's not gonna bet call ace king mixed right he's just gonna bet fold ace king he's not gonna have the correct range he's not gonna recognize what a backdoor is like all all these things uh so mm -hmm. yeah it, it feels to me like this is a hand i i would have misplayed relative to you because i would have felt too shackled by mm -hmm. uh like this is I'm, I'm happy to like bluff raise 100 of the hands that i should have a 15 percent frequency with but, but i would rarely go this far mm -hmm. uh but i think it's a good spot to, to go for and yeah. the flat preflop is connected to you being willing to do this that doesn't work otherwise because if you flat shitty hands preflop and then you just play normal post flop. You're, you're not. Yeah, yeah. Then you screwed. Yeah. Um, one one thing I I I should say as well is I I feel like this is a spot that I would misplay against a uh, against a very high stakes pro. And, and I, I would like to learn the other way as well. Yeah, you you have to know the other way. I I mean there's there's no harm in it as long as you're willing to 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 keep it in the context of. Uh, I don't, I'm not forced to play like this because for me, uh, I, I used to have a very positive red line. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I started playing higher stakes and all the tricks were, weren't were working suddenly, <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, shit, I don't actually know what I'm doing if the other guy is not massively overfolding in all these spots. Yeah. So I started learning theory. And when you learn theory, uh, your red line disappears at the beginning. <laughs> uh because all so these great spots you're just falling right yeah um then I, I i went back and and kind of found my way in between but uh yeah i think it's it's very like the, this fits with a red line it fits with with not knowing theory and i think knowing theory it's very important to know when when it's not relevant like this spot where um yeah it's just not relevant because even in theory theory would have you never raise this but raising this would be like a 
0 0.05 BB per hundred mistake. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure if you put the right stuff into PO, like the right input, it would tell you to just raise everything. It's just very hard to to get all of that stuff into PO. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's very easy. You just input that he's over falling to the race. And, um, right, but then then you also need to have that he's playing other streets differently. That that he's you know, blasting off on turn too much. And yeah, you need, yeah, I, th I think, I think there's, there's too many variables that, that, that any solver would be able to really have an accurate output. Mm -hmm. okay. Nice hand. So check raise the nine seven. Seems like it. Definitely considering it. <laughs> yeah. Finding a size that I'm probably going to be giving up on rivers. Yeah, and and this is a play also that this is outside of GTO and that your hand should be just a pure fault. Yeah. Um, but this is probably heavily printing, I would guess. We should do it. We should do a session where you have to play like me and I have to play uh, theory. <laughs> And see how well we do. I, I mean, I, I, I've played like you a lot. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Yeah. I, I just don't play like you on YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, what was I going to say? I, I made a video in, in one of my courses where I played, I think, 25 or 50 Zoom on, on GG Network. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, playing 100 VPIP, <laughs> uh, like raising every hand. Yeah. Uh, never see betting flop. Never see betting turn. Fuck and ju and and just bluff raising based on the other guy's sizing. Is the concept of that video to show how good reads you can get? Um, it was just like blind sizing tells. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I got nineteen out of twenty raises through. That's crazy. That is really crazy. Where it's just like if someone bets small, you bluff raise. If he bets yeah. small, did you have to? Was it like mandatory? Even on like a full flush board or something? To, to, oh no, I, I didn't have to, but I just did okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's interesting. You know, I feel I, like I, I under bluff raise these days versus bets because the meta used to be in 2015, bluff raise was always value. So the people that figured that out were bluff raising it. Sorry, river raises were his value. Um, so people that were bluff raising rivers were just printing money because everyone the population was just folding. Mm -hmm. But then it it kind of swung the other direction and people started just way over calling. Uh, I don't know where it's at at the moment in high stakes. Um, I, I mean, people are in in GTO mode. No. Yeah. So they tried to mimic GTO, and then yeah, they've been trying that for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I mean, tool, tools are better than, than they used to be. Some of the high stakes guys are, are fairly okay at it. And, and when someone tries to mimic GTO, they're going to look like a station because GTO yeah. uh, mixes very station equals. And, mm -hmm. 